Uh, thank you very much to the organisers for asking me to speak. And I'm going to start by saying that HRT is no longer called HRT, it is now called MHT, or Menopausal Hormone Therapy. Or sometimes, just to confuse us, HT, Hormone Therapy. Uh, Professor Rodney Baber from Sydney was uh, very gracious. He gave this talk at Sydney Health Ed and he has allowed us to use this presentation. So thank you to Rod. So we are going to talk about the basic principles of menopause management and to understand the use of hormone therapy and its contraindications. Menopause, you know what that is. It is the last egg and the last period, but sometimes periods happen very haphazardly, so you can only say it's really happened 12 months after the event. Uh, the diagnosis is absolutely clinical, based on signs and symptoms in an appropriately aged lady, but there is a caveat there with one of our cases, um, and you don't need to do hormone levels. Uh, but estradiol levels typically will go from being about 400 uh, average in reproductive life to being about 20 picomoles per litre, so there's quite a considerable drop in estrogen levels. And menopause is about quality of life, managing symptoms, being able to do the things that you want to do. And in one lady's uh, sort of term that she said, now that I'm on hormone therapy, I feel normal again. So menopause is about quality of life, coping and feeling normal uh, rather than being ill. Because a lot of people say, why are you medicalising menopause? So this is a lovely summary statement made by the International Menopause Society about hormone therapy use. Uh, and effectively all of the menopause societies around the world agree with this, that the principal indication for hormone therapy is alleviation of bothersome symptoms, which are mostly vasomotor symptoms, but might be sleep disturbance, joint aches and pains, mood or what have you. This should be part of an overall strategy for midlife health, and the dose and duration of hormone therapy should be consistent with treatment goals for that woman. Oestrogen only is appropriate if they've had a hysterectomy. Uh, and the sort of caveat there is when they have had severe endometriosis, you may add a progestogen to try and prevent endometriosis recurrence. And I believe you've had a talk about that today. Uh, and oestrogen plus a progestogen should be used when the womb is present and when they've also had an endometrial ablation, they still need that progestogen in case there's little pockets of endometrium left. We don't use hormone therapy after breast cancer unless uh, there's a really good reason and unless in dis discussion with their treating specialist. Topical low-dose estrogen is very useful if there are vaginal and urinary symptoms and they don't have many other symptoms. And you can use that pretty uh, low-risk long-term. So these have not changed either. This is when we don't use hormone therapy. So PV bleeding that's unusual and you haven't really diagnosed, especially a long time after menopause. Hormone dependent cancers, active liver disease, pregnancy of course, uh, any VTE, uh, I, in really, if they've had an AMI in the past at any point, I would be hesitant to use hormone therapy and porphyria cutanea tarda, which we don't see that often. So Jan walks in. Jan is your typical 52-year-old lady who had last had a period 15 months ago. She consumes a little bit too much alcohol and she's a little bit overweight, but she worries about flushes, night sweats, not sleeping, being cranky and low mood and anxious skin crawling like ants under the skin that can drive them mad and some vaginal dryness. The symptoms are affecting her work and quality of life and she's on no meds. Uh, she's had just a general sort of, uh, this is a typical history for someone who's 52, Lappy, lap col cholecystectomy, uh, Menneke was at normal age, she has two children and she breastfed and she was on the pill until age 45. Uh, contraception is in place and her family history is such that mum has had osteoporosis and fractured neck of femur. Uh, examination is normal. You, of course, do her normal screening, uh, mammogram, pap smear, or cervical screening, etc. They're all fine. So we're good to go. So Jan is postmenopausal. The history makes the diagnosis with Jan, and she's pretty easy, and you, everyone can sort of do her easily. Uh, you do take a good history of menopausal symptoms because it's based on hi history. There is an excellent menopause symptom score 
present both on the Jean Hales website and on the Australasian Menopause Society website to just try and quantify and objectify their symptoms. Uh, do consider other causes if symptoms are atypical and recur record personal and family history because that family history of osteoporosis is very important for this lady. Uh, menopause is also a very important time to, to reinforce uh, good health, really, midlife health, but also looking for the future, cardiovascular, cognitive uh, and bone health. So the ladies will really want a hormone level checked. We do not need to check FSH or estradiol levels. And they'll come in saying, I've had salivary levels checked. This is what my naturopath wants done. You can just tick all the boxes and organise it. And you say, no, the levels will fluctuate in perimenopause and will bottom out at menopause. What you tell me is important. We will give therapy as discussed. And then we will base our uh, therapy changes on what you have discussed after being on therapy for a while. Uh, now, the only, con uh, only sort of exception to the rule is if a woman of young age stops having periods uh, and you don't quite expect that from, based on her history, then I would do hormone levels, but that would be probably less than 40 years of age. So we, we, we've rocked through Jan and now we're going to have Annette, who is 48, she's married with three children and she has her uterus still in. She's nice and slim, she has flushes day and night doesn't sleep and finds that difficult when you're working. Uh, she's had irregular periods for 11 months and her family history is not very special and she's very practical. She said, I need hormones doctor. Well, that makes it a bit easier. So she is perimenopausal. She's still having periods, but she's getting those breakthrough symptoms. The trouble with perimenopause is sometimes estrogen is high and you can have too much estrogen symptoms and sometimes it's low and you'll have low estrogen symptoms. It will vary. It's like a dog's breakfast. Uh, so we don't need uh, blood tests again. She will want them possibly, but you, you, you will calm her and say, no, we don't need to do that. It's based on history uh, and also examining her, make sure her blood pressure's all right and doing the normal things. Does she need contraception? We haven't talked about that uh, with her. If, if so, she could still have the combined oral contraceptive pill, probably low dose because she's 48 until age 50. A Mirena would be a really excellent option. That will settle the bleeding down and then we can use whatever form of oestrogen. Uh, her irregular bleeding, I think, is due to perimenopause. But if it doesn't settle and you do institute hormone therapy, then it should probably be followed up by an ultrasound. So um, there's a lovely information sheet on all of the different hormone therapy options at the Australasian Menopause Society stand here today with Vicky, and she's happy to give you... It's got everything, all the different options. It's got PBS, non-PBS, combinations, and it goes by low dose, mid dose, high dose. It's a really excellent tool. It is also available on the website. For her, because she does have some oestrogen around, you probably start with low dose to minimise bleeding and breast tenderness. A sequential product would be useful because if you give her a continuous one, she's going to bleed irregularly and she won't want that. But a sequential product will give her a regular uh, scheduled bleed. So the Fomostin product, Fomostin 110 or 210 if she needs uh, higher doses. Trisequins is very useful in a sweet little wheel, but it is not on the PBS. Uh, and the Astalis Sequi patch are all very good options. But some will want a tailored combination. Some will be pushing for body identical hormone therapy uh, because they might have heard about breast cancer risk or whatever. So you might use any form of oestrogen, uh, such as a, a patch twice a week or a tablet or whatever, and give them a separate progestogen, such as micronized progesterone, which will be body identical then. And they will have that for 10 to 14 days per month, just the progestogen. And then they will have a bleed after that and the oestrogen is given through the month. Uh, and that's a good uh, combination. But then when there is, uh, bl when bleeds tailor off or it's been six to 12 months and you think they're closer to menopause, you can try them on a continuous regimen and it will really depend on bleeding. If bleeding settles down or stops, then they're fine uh, and you just continue with that as long as they need it for symptoms. So Cherie's gonna slightly interrupt the apple card of what, what we're comfortable with. She's 22 and I've seen a girl just like this this week. Uh, she's a university student. Meneke was at age 16. She had spotting for one day every three to four months, just spotting, not, not bleeding. She hasn't been sexually active and then she went on to have eight months of amenorrhea. So in me, this would be triggering, triggering alarm bells and I'd wanna look into this further. No flushes or estradiol deficiency uh, symptoms. 
uh, at all. No real past history, there's no family history of note and no intellectual disability or early menopause. Uh, examination was unremarkable, she was nice and slim, Tanner was stage four. And so she has secondary amenorrhea. Uh, it could be due to pregnancy in some, hyperprolactinemia, hypothalamic amenorrhea, which would be my first guess in this sort of age group, menopause or PCOS. But you do need to investigate for premature ovarian insufficiency in any young woman with four months of irregular periods. Uh, so I, I, this was ex almost exactly the same FSH that I had with my young lady this week was 56. So I always, my heart sinks as the FSH rises in, in these young ones. Everything else was normal, but her estrogen was undetectable. Uh, we repeated it because you do need to repeat it after four to six weeks to confirm that it's premature ovarian insufficiency and it was still elevated. So a really difficult case, uh, she's premature menopause essentially, a lot of difficult discussions about her future uh, and about treatment. Uh, this is usually idiopathic, it may arise spontaneously but there may be a family history uh, and we don't really know what causes uh, the majority of these but we know that follicles just sort of run down very quickly uh, at, at an accelerated rate or just disappear. We know that if we don't treat menopause or premature ovarian insufficiency in these young women, there is an increased incidence of osteoporosis and fracture, heart disease, cognitive impairment and premature death, and that's an awful thing to have to discuss with a 22-year-old, not to mention the fertility type of thing too. So the cornerstone of treatment is some form of hormone therapy until the age of natural menopause, unless there's a contraindication such as breast cancer, etc. So she could have the combined oral contraceptive pill of any type. She could have any form of hormone therapy until around 50. Uh, there are lots of causes there, and when you refer them to me, I do lots of these different things, and I rarely get anything, but the fragile X mutation is highlighted there. And the most causes uh, that I will see are due to removal of ovaries, inadvertent or purposeful, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, so treatment for uh, cancer, um, but some you, you will just won't get any cause. Some you'll get sort of thyroid antibodies that are positive and you'll think, oh, it's autoimmune of some nature, but you won't get a cause. But Fragile X is very important. So you know about Fragile X as a syndrome, but carrier status, women will be essentially normal, but may go into an early menopause and may have a child with, with Fragile X. That's the other important thing. So if there's a family history of intellectual disability, you should sort of start thinking. Um, and this is one of those triplet repeat co conditions. Uh, these women may spontaneously conceive and I've, I've had some difficult scenarios whereby families have been very upset where the index lady did not have children and she was a fragile X carrier, did not tell the family who also were fragile X carriers and then the child was had fragile X. So you just really need to be... Uh, aware of this, that there can be a very messy scenario, even if this lady isn't intending to have children. Uh, it can get very tricky. So she does have premature ovarian insufficiency, devastating for a 22-year-old. All of her chromosomes and fragile X were normal. Uh, other autoantibodies and thyroid were normal. Her ovaries looked to be very inactive. Uh, so we need to assess her osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease risk and we know instantly that they are higher uh, because she won't be covered by the normal hormones that she would be until 45 to 50. If fertility is an issue, uh, look at AMH and that again is a, a, a can of worms because if it's low they still might be able to conceive and in 10 to 15 percent of women who have premature ovarian insufficiency, they may spontaneously just ovulate and they may become pregnant. So it's 10 to 15 percent is a good amount of uh, women, it's not 85 percent. Counselling is very important by someone who knows what to do, uh, so that's, and those people are around. So what we do uh, in these ladies is we do opt for higher doses of hormone therapy if tolerated because they would normally be covered by a, a fairly high amount of oestrogen until 45 or, six, or 50 or thereabouts. So if, you, if it's hormone therapy, we use higher doses. The combined oral contraceptive pill at long cycle may also be a very good option. Louise then comes along. It's a busy day for you, and she's 48 with two children. Uh, Normotensive, slightly overweight. She has flushes, sweats, and sleep disturbance, and her last period was 13 months ago. She's had focal and non-focal migraine, which has been linked to maybe ovulation or around the period, 
and the migraines have been worse in the last time since menopause. She can't have hormone therapy is what she has been told. So this is making your day tricky. Migraines are around 17%, but they peak at around 30% at age 40. 50% of migraine sufferers aren't treated, and some will relate to either high estrogens, fluctuating estrogens, and in some cases, quite low estrogen. Migraine with aura are more common when estrogen levels are high, and hormone-related migraines are typically uh, focal or atypical. We know that the pill is contraindicated in women suffering migraine with aura because of the stroke risk, even though the the data around that aren't really marvellous, but we don't do it. Uh, but after menopause, 45% of women with hormone-related headaches worsen, 15% improve, and 35% are no different. Hormone therapy is not contraindicated in women with focal and non-focal migraines. So this is very different because the pill doses are up here, hormone therapy doses are down here, it's chalk and cheese with what we're dealing with uh, and that risk of the stroke risk is not there. And there is a really excellent uh, information page on the Australasian Menopause Society website called Migraine, Menopause and Hormone Therapy which very nicely goes through this even with the hormonal changes before menopause. Uh, it's brilliant. So Louise can use hormone therapy. We aim to keep her hormone levels stable because we don't want them to fluctuate. Uh, I would always probably try transdermal treatment first, so estradiol twice a week, which would be useful, and then a continuous progestogen, uh, and micronized progesterone might be a good option for her because it's body-identical hormone therapy and will be more used to what her body's dealing with. We do use the lowest effective dose, uh, and those with REM-activated sleep migraine, oral estrogen at night may help. There's some data for that. So we're going to Virginia. We're nearly there. We're at the end of these almost. 51 years of age, she's generally well, but she had a DVT after complicated knee surgery 10 years ago. Uh, she has no real other risk factors, and she's used all sorts of things which other people have said would be useful for her bothersome symptoms, and they didn't work. And she's been told she can't take hormone therapy. This is from the WHI, the yellow bars there are indicating that there is an increased risk of VTE uh, and PE with uh, hormone therapy use, and we know those data very well, with oral preparations. So there's difference between the different types of hormone therapy we use. So the risk varies by route of administration, probably dose, and type of progestogen. And this is a lovely study looking at different types of hormone therapy. So you'll see the orange bar uh, in the middle is the lowest uh, risk of VTE, which is a combination of transdermal estradiol and micronized progesterone, so body identical hormone therapy. Right next to the left, the little uh, bar on the left of that's grey is transdermal estradiol, so the studies do not support a higher risk of VTE with transdermal hormone therapy, but you'll see on the extremes when you're looking at oral estrogen or estrogen and progestogen combinations, that there is a higher risk when it's not those particular products we've just mentioned. So uh, this is quite comforting. So Virginia may use hormone therapy and lowest dose and transdermal treatment I think is best. Uh, and because of that study that you just saw, you might be tending to use uh, micronized progesterone rather than synthetic ones. There is a lovely US Endocrine Society statement from 2015 saying that we can use VTE here. Uh, you do need to avoid hered uh, hereditary thrombophilia, so I will do a screen for that usually if they've had a VTE. And sometimes I will get them to see a hematologist just to make sure that we haven't missed something and to get their guidance and also guidance for travel, etc., uh, which will be important. And you you really just want to avoid uh, inappropriate treatment in obese, hypertensive, smoking or diabetic ladies. So we'll finish with Bridget, who's 39 with two children. Her mum and sister both had breast cancer, her aunt had ovarian cancer. She does have BRCA1 on genetic testing and she has had risk-reducing bilateral salpingoophorectomy, so she's had a premature surgical menopause. And now she has severe menopausal symptoms, so she's coming to you. And she's elected to not have bilateral mastectomy, but to look at uh, surveillance for her breast health. Can she use hormone therapy? Well, uh, BRCA1 is not uncommon, and there's more, more and more being diagnosed. Uh, so menopause-specific quality of life is compromised if they've had a, a salpingoophorectomy, uh, and counselling is extremely important because many of them will get devastating symptoms. 
Most guidelines support the use of hormone therapy until the nat normal age of menopause, but you do need to discuss alternatives, SSRIs, SNRIs, gabapentin, clonidine, etc. There are other options for symptoms, but I worry about her cardiovascular and bone health if she's 39. Uh, so, so there was a lovely prospective cohort of 462 women with both BRCA1 and 2. 155 underwent a bilateral salpingoophorectomy, the others didn't, and they had quite a good follow-up. They did have a reduction in their breast cancer risk when they had their ovaries removed, but if you look at the last dot point there, they didn't have an increase in breast cancer risk when they used hormone therapy after that. So that was quite comforting. And uh, there have been a, a lot of different uh, ways of looking at this, but you can see the odds ratios are all lower, which means that there is no increased risk, although uh, Professor Hickey has just told me that there's been one study recently that says the addition of the progestogen may increase the risk. So this is comforting for these women with BRCA1 and 2. Uh, and these are just women at high risk of breast cancer for general purposes, not the BRCA1 and 2. You can use hormone therapy if the symptoms are severe. It doesn't add to the risk of breast cancer associated with benign breast disease or a family history. So if the family history is there, your risk is up. And I tell women, I think we can use hormone therapy. I think your risk of getting breast cancer is due to your family history. Uh, we've talked about BRCA1 and 2, but any decision to treat must be the subject of a very, uh, very careful discussion such that they know their benefits and risks and, and it is you may need to refer for, to someone else for specialist advice because this is a tricky area. So in conclusion, uh, the midlife health check is very important. I sort of love it when they have symptoms because you can actually get them, grab them, screen them and think of their future and be nice to them of course. Menopause is a normal physiological event. We're not trying to medicalise it but we're trying to have healthy, happy, women who can cope and do the things uh, that they're meant to do in life. Uh, so feeling normal is good and quality of life is extremely important. If you have a younger woman with more than four months of irregular menses, they should be investigated for premature ovarian insufficiency and hormone therapy is the most effective option for troublesome estradiol deficiency symptoms and in healthy women around the uh, time of menopause, the benefits far outweigh the risks. That's what the international societies say. Uh, we've talked about women with uh, migraine and VTE and BRCA1 and treatment should be individualised. There are some lovely tools the Jean Howells uh, stand will be very happy to give you this lovely tool and the other health information tools that carefully take you through menopause and what to do uh, in special considerations, doses, when not to use hormone therapy and is very clinically useful. And thank you very much uh, for having me to speak and I hope to see you here or with this. <laughs>